Okay, we are now recording. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Antel. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the South Carolina State Library. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this session with Chef Steve Harden. Uh, it will be posted later on our YouTube playlist. Um, you should have um, the ability to post questions in the chat, um, but please do feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions as we go through. Um, we want this to be interactive and, and fully beneficial to you guys um, as we go along. Um, closed captioning is available if you need that option. Um, if you click down on the more option at the bottom of your screen, it will come up with a closed captioning option. And that is what the live on Zoom with Rev.com at the top of your screen uh, denotes. And let's see what else. Um, this webinar today is brought to us, made part impossible by money from LSTA, um, as well as a grant from the Network of National Libraries of Medicine. And thank you everyone for being here and let's get started, Chef. I'm handing it over to you. Thank you very much. We'll see, it's two o'clock my time, four o'clock your time. Good afternoon this afternoon, we'll go with that. My name is Chef Steve. Feel free to call me Chef Steve. That's what I go by. Uh, we are formally informal, so to speak, at, at Escoffier, everybody is Chef and their first name. So I am Chef Steve. If you forget, sorry, it's still gonna be Chef Steve. So I have two rules in my classes, you guys. Rule number one is have fun and rule number two is have more fun. So we can sort of figure everything out together today. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, I want a, a big thank you uh, to Rebecca, to Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we've, we've put some time into this and, and one, I hope that shows. And two, I hope we all get something out of this. So we learn more, of course, when we have fun. Um, it's easier to kind of get along when we have fun now. But what's the theme we're going over is knife safety. So having fun in the kitchen does not remove that responsibility for safety with each other, with our students, um, and them with each other. So safety is a responsibility to me, not a rule. Uh, it, it goes without saying, but it's one of those things we always say. So I always make that clear to my students um, when I open up as well. And of course, you guys just experienced my little icebreaker um, <laughs> with have fun and have more fun. And then another icebreaker I like to use with my students is what do you guys think? And either unmute yourselves is fine or put it in chat. I do have chat open here um, as well, although I don't think it's gonna ding in my ear. So forgive me if I keep kind of looking at the camera and then looking down. Uh, I got my laptop right here. So what's the most important thing in the kitchen, you guys? What do you think? I mean, and I would say kitchen. my kitchen aid. Right. <laughs> I'll give you that. I give, I've got one of those myself right down here. Oh, this is my kitchen, by the way, everyone. Welcome. We've got 22 people packed in this kitchen. Oh, okay, so cooking kitchen is the most important. <laughs> Safe okay. practices are Safety. the most important. Very much. Ooh, the person, Allison, I love that. The person cooking. <laughs> Safety first, most definitely. But you guys are all wrong. It's coffee. So, um, eh. okay, um, that's my other icebreaker I like to use, especially for those of y'all that may want to get into baking or really like that aspect of things, or especially the students that could have an interest in, in a reality of our industry really is the, the folks that serve our guests work off hours, especially if you're at a breakfast place, especially if you're into baking and pastries, right? Somebody I worked at a coffee shop at... for six months, got there at 3.30. There you go, Rebecca, right? What time did you get up? Muffin. Three thir well, I got up about three. I got there at 3.30. There was a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, 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 it all makes sense. Everything <laughs> I do, 
in the on, on honestly with the, the train the trainer idea everybody everything i do is 90 percent for the viewer the guest the, the the fan the audience if you will 10 percent for me to kind of just make myself more comfortable um but especially in front of students they could be just as nervous as we could be potentially um so I try to relate to them with comedy. That's my personal style. Um, but whatever makes you comfortable, and that's going to come across in front of your students. Um, my shtick, if you will, is, is relating with, with entertainment, references, movies, and whatnot. Uh, but that wasn't my goal initially. It, it, I discovered that by coming up with a reference that students could relate to and then it turned into making me even more comfortable quote unquote performing um, which we'll get into more when i get into the actual physical demonstration but when i was trying to come up with a way for a student to remember what to do with their other hand that doesn't hold the knife and it, it just rolled off my tongue i said the it's like a claw and i had just watched toy story with my let's see it she was 10 at the time with my daughter up like three days earlier and I went, oh, the, the claw. Okay, and then a year later, I realized Adam's family, you got Thing walking around. So finding a way to relate. And, and ironically, if their parents, uh, adult students catch on to the claw joke, but as well as the Adam's family, that'd be both of them, the color one and the black and white one. So it makes sense, I guess is what I'm getting at. And um, I kind of digress, but I've got a couple slides to share with you guys. Uh, most definitely. Yep. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, oh, see, I saw. I had a little notice. It filled up the screen more. So, I've kind of, any questions, by the way, about anything, feel free to come off mute and just, chef, question. That's fine. You guys are stuck with me for the next, well, I guess you could just log off. So, this isn't as powerful as I thought it would be coming out. But you guys are stuck with me for the next 50 minutes. Five zero, uh, but that's that is our goal, and I do respect your time, and so that's that's kind of what I'm working with here. We want to keep you in that in that hour time frame. But if you have any questions, feel free to come off mute, drop them in chat, start waving your arms for those of you that are on camera that I can see. Thank you, welcome, and those of you that aren't, you are just as welcome. But I just can't see you waving your hands around if you're not if your camera's not on. If you have questions, so let's dive in. I have a, assuming I did this right, presentation for you guys. And let's not start in the middle. Let's, why don't we start at the beginning? Share. I will let you know at this point, everyone, I do not have the chat open. Um, chat. Oh, okay. I do now. Put that over in the corner. Okay. So I am Chef Steve from the Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. We are named for Auguste Escoffier. He is one of the most important chefs in the history of the modern kitchen, and hardly anybody has ever heard of him. He really was one of the first celebrity chefs. He was a chef, I say was, because he was back in the black and white days. He, did, he passed away in 1936. But Chef Auguste Escoffier is responsible for our mother sauces is responsible for the brigade system that you and your students may know as stations. Well, formally in the, in the, in the kitchen, it's called the brigade. So all the different stations, it was Escoffier's idea. And he took this from the, his military service for efficiency, consistency, and specialization. He took that form and function he got from the military and applied it to restaurant kitchens. So instead of having, and before his, uh, he incorporated the brigade system, most of the time it was one chef would cook a, a table's entire meal. Whereas after Escoffier and the brigade system, you had specialization. What does that look like for those of you that may have not ever uh, worked in, on the line in a restaurant? It's what you see on Hell's Kitchen. It, it really is. Somebody works meat, somebody works fish, somebody works garnish, which is the vegetable side, fryer and on and on and on. There's over 20 different stations in the, on the formal brigade. That's also where we get chef, chef de whatever, chef de tournant, chef de patisserie, chef de 
chocolatier, chef de garmanger, chef de cuisine, okay? Those are all the French names because he was French. He was born in Nice, France uh, in 1846. So that's where that all comes from. He also came up with mise en place, which means everything in its place. Um, and, and forgive me, by the way, if some of this information you guys already know or some if there might be one person that doesn't know, uh, I, I want to cover this information, of course, from the vocabulary on. Uh, mise en place, meaning everything in its place, not just created for cooking shows. That's where we have everything pre-set up, measured out, cut. We do all that first. That is all for Chef, because of Chef Escoffier. So his most famous book he wrote is Le Guide de Culinaire. It is still in print to this day. He wrote that back in 1917, I believe. It's either 13 or 17. 5,000 recipes in that book. It, it's not a page turner. It is written for the professional, um, but it's a wonderful historical reference book. So that is Chef Auguste Escoffier. And we at Escoffier School are still partnered uh, with Escoffier Group in France. His great grandson, Michel, actually comes out about once a year. So here's where our goals are this week, or not this week, excuse me, but over these series of webinars over the next couple of weeks, you guys. Tonight, we're going to cover knife safety and techniques, the basic tools, your basic equipment, everywhere from our board down to the knives to our stance, things that we need to communicate uh, to our students. Next week, physically looking at what happens when we cook. How do we cook? What are the different options we can use when cooking? Uh, denaturing of proteins, if you want to put the science hat on. Um, we'll touch on the chemical side of things, i.e. ceviche and cooking with an acid, but really the, the takeaway is going to be heat and the different forms that we can go ahead and apply heat to a protein of fat or a carb. And then wrap it all up with, well, how do we, once we know these things, or once we've been at least, at least exposed to these techniques, which is a, one of my key words, how do we present that to people? whether they are teens, whether they are adults, whether they're tweens, whether they're little ones, with however. And then we're going to close up with a dessert. So if you may have noticed, we're doing a pico de gallo, kind of an appetizer idea, can also go into other things, but something simple. Then our entree, chicken street tacos, and then we're going to wrap it up with caramel apple slices. So think caramel apple, but stepped up. And how do we quote unquote, elevate these simple dishes. So that's sort of our takeaway goals, you guys, and what we're gonna be covering. So session one, knives, knives is this. So here is Chef Steve's top nine rules. And these are in reality, you know, not to have fun, have more fun, that's just my personal shtick, but no horseplay ever, ever. Okay, rule number two, go back to rule number one. I know that's kind of cliched process, but it, it works. Yeah, ever, no horseplay. The sharper the knife, this is reality. The sharper the knife, the safer it is. So you don't have to force. You are in control of that knife. And there is technique involved, which we're gonna cover, but just rule of thumb, all things being equal, the sharper knife is safer. And we'll, I'll show you guys how to, hone and, and keep that blade sharp. Clean knives, okay, for a couple reasons. We don't want to potentially have some of the metal eaten away. Now this takes a lot of time to do this with the science and whatnot, but we keep, clean not, keep knives clean because they're safe that way, okay? No food buildup. We, when you're using the knife properly and it's riding along that knuckle, if there's food buildup, that can start bouncing off the knuckle, i.e. unsafe. Technique, there's that key word again. And I will mention that frequently throughout this series. Hey, look, refer back to proper technique. So we start slow. If any of you have taken any sort of musical training, whether it be in school or as an adult or anything, it, if you start too fast, doing it wrong, you're just gonna be doing it wrong faster. So 
technique. Our speed comes from repetition of proper technique. Using the correct knife, we have many different knives here. And they're designed in a way to have specific functions. Some are multi-use, others are not. Um, nine times out of 10, you can get away with just a chef's knife. But in the situation where a chef's knife is not gonna cut it, you do need to use a specialty knife. That's rare per se in the home kitchen is so like a chef's knife, a paring knife, and maybe a bread knife. Uh, me personally, I fabricate and cut up a chicken with a paring knife. Just happens to be, go back to the way my mentor taught me. Um, that's weird, I get it, but that's just how I, how personally I do it. And speed comes from practice. Definitely don't cut towards your fingers. That's why we have techniques. So these are Steve's, it's not really nine, right? Couple references back, but our top most important things to remember, understand, as well as share with your students. And each one of these relates to a technique. So let's talk about boards. Wood or plastic, rubber feet or damp towel. The key there is we don't want to chase the board across the counter. That's bad. We don't want to chase the food across the board on top of the counter we're chasing the board across. So it's these different steps and little minor things. So we get a rubberized board or you put a damp towel underneath your board to secure it in place, whether you're in your home kitchen or whether you are in the library. Okay, we look through those steps for safety. Your stance, just be comfortable. There really isn't specifics in, in terms of the most efficient stance. We could get deep into ergonomics, you guys, but really it's personal comfort. I would have to say don't hunch. And, and I will show you these guys when we get to the demo, port, demo part as well. I'll walk through it real quick. But just try not to hunch over. If you are too tall for the counter, you need to get something to elevate that board to have you in a comfortable stance, especially if you're going to be cooking for a long period of time or prepping for a long period of time. So if you need to have a little turn in your shoulders or your hips, that's fine. You don't need to have your core engaged like you're doing a bunch of crunches at the gym, but have your pelvis supported. So not bowed out and not thrust forward. You wanna be somewhere in the middle and have some core stability. The only big rule I have with stance is don't lock your knees. What happens 20 seconds later if you lock your knees, right? <laughs> You're down. Bad if you have a knife in your hand. Hey, we don't want that. Pinch grip and the claw, which we will get into when I show you guys the demo portion. So we're gonna get into the demo. See, super simple. I don't work with death by PowerPoint. No, not that, mm -mm. no, 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 no. Before I was a chef, I worked at corporate for Sears Home Services. A um, lot of PowerPoints. It, with, mm -mm. So no death by PowerPoint for Chef Steve. So the key takeaways that we're gonna focus on during this presentation is yes, we're gonna produce a pico de gallo, but that just happens to be the final result is I'm gonna go over knife techniques. Now, not specifically focus on classic dimension. Okay, I'll throw those in there for vocab, but that's not really the takeaway that, I, that I'm going for here, you guys, that a julienne is an eighth by eighth by two inches. Okay, classically speaking. The pro, or a brunoise is an eighth by eighth by eighth cube not what we're looking to reproduce here is that's fun knowledge, but the technique we do to produce those cuts is exactly the same. So eye contact, that's real important, especially if you're with a camera, is learning your, your material enough to where you don't have to read it off a cue card. You can maintain eye contact with the camera, which even to this point, you guys, I'm not on, you know, I have the presentation on the, on the, slideshow, I still find myself staring at my camera. That's a good thing. And that just comes from experience. Um, framing is important. Do you want your background all out of whack? So keeping in mind what you have behind you, if you're filming remote, your lighting, we're not going to get super deep into um, unless you guys have the big budget for 
studio lighting and whatnot, but there is some advice I may have for lighting. Then we can talk about software and stuff that's more um, near the end. Um, I have some personal opinions. Really, it's just one opinion. I love Zoom. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, there is functionality in all the different, um, and there's pros and cons with all the different popular softwares that are out there. Questions at all, you guys, about anything before I dive in. I'm actually right on track. I would say I might even be ahead of the game here from personally what I'm used to. And it's okay if we don't have questions. That's, that's fine. I don't mind. Okay. Well, shoot, I guess that's that. Good luck. Have a nice, no, I'm kidding. What do you do the first thing you do when you go in the kitchen, you guys? What should you do first? Wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Well, well said, exactly. And we got it in, in, in chat as well. Yep, wash your hands. Guess what? We do it the same way we've always done, even before COVID. But hot water, soap, 20 seconds. Now you can count to 20 if you want, that's boring. Ooh, this ought to be good. I still bet at least one of you don't know this. Do your ABCs or Twinkle Twinkle. That's a little more exciting. And if you didn't know, it's the same song, by the way. If you don't believe me, hum it out, see what happens. The kids love that one, by the way. Yes, it's fun to get adults and even high school students to sing their ABCs. So, 20 seconds, hot water and soap, away we go. Let's talk our station real quick. Um, this is it. All right, so I have, where's my food gonna go? Super important, how many times have you guys been ready to, even at home during dinner or what, whatnot, you're ready to plate up, your, your meal is done in the pan, or if you're doing a one pot and you go, oh shoot, now I've got to go get the platter or the plates or whatever. Do that first. So I have where my food's going to go. I have my little trash bowl here. I also have my trash can just right around the corner, but that's not always practical, especially in the professional kitchen and especially, say, in the middle of a library, okay, if you're doing the demo. So you have somewhere to go. Put this on your list of what should I have, and that's a trash um, slash compost as well. Okay, trash, compost, recycle. Okay, that, that's of course up to you guys, but whatever your standards are, put, put that on the list. You need to think, where am I gonna put the weight? Especially if you're in a framed camera, you don't want all that piled up. Say any solution. Okay, this is just bleach. Okay, 200 parts per million, which works out to be, so actually it's somewhere between 50 and 200 is acceptable. Basically that's a tablespoon. Um, oh shoot, my math is off. You guys might even know this. Somebody could help me. I want to say it's a tablespoon per gallon. No, tablespoon per 15 gallons, I think. I don't remember. Between the 21 of us, I'm sure we could figure that one out. Well, come on now. I have to look you it just up did every surf time. safe food handler. Someone right? should know this. Every it's... time I refill this, I have to look it up, you guys. I swear. <laughs> Seriously. Oh my God. All right. And we have our ingredients knives. Our honing steel, whenever you have a knife out, you should have this out, especially if you're going to share that technique with your students. Okay, that's my station. I've got, actually, I end up with having more than one towel. That's okay. So that's really everything we're gonna need. Of course, we have our knives. So here we go. Let's talk equipment. Three different kinds of knives here, you guys. We have, this knife here is called a Sentoku knife. Okay, it's a Japanese chef's knife. I'm sure you've seen them, but let's talk about why they are the way they are. Um, they're tall, so you still have something to ride on the knuckle. They're flatter, but they do still have a little curve in them. And the reason they're designed this, oh, and they have these scallops, that's what these are called. The reason those are there is to prevent kind of a vacuum with the food on the side. 
So they can allow an air break so food won't stick to the side of the knife as much as the chef's knife style. So the reason this is flatter is in Japanese cuisine, they do a lot more vegetable cookery and the types of vegetable in Japanese cuisine that will be more conducive to more of an up and down motion as opposed to the rocking motion you get with a chef's knife. So really that just has to do with what they're using it for. Um, or picture say, for example, um, oh boy, radicchio, not radicchio. Um, I totally forgot. So let's take a large root vegetable, for example. And mo a lot of times in Japanese cooking, they're going to unroll it. Like you would say a butterfly, a, a loin. And so you need this long, flat, not as big and clumsy as a cleaver. We don't need it. We need more precision. But the shape of the knife is conducive to the cuisine, really, is what we're getting at. This is your classic chef's knife. This particular knife and this uh, design on it comes from the, let me go up to the close up here, comes from, it is Damascus steel and it's been hand forged. This guy here has just been stamped out in the factory somewhere. Sheet metal comes down, they hit a die and they just stamp out a hundred of them. You know, we're a thousand a minute. This guy was made by hand. It, it is German. It's a little stouter, it's a little heavier. Definitely than this guy. Sentoku knife is always going to be lighter. Um, great for doing cabbages, potatoes, things that are a little sturdier and we need a little more heft in it. Um, a stamped blade can get just as sharp as a um, hammered blade, a hand forged is the word. I can't word today, I'm sorry, everybody. Stamped, forged. They can be just as sharp, but this is going to maintain its edge longer, not have to be sharpened on a stone or on, say, a belt sander or a grinding wheel as often as this guy. Okay. The parts of the knives, they're all the same. They're all three, and I'll get to this one in a short second. They're all full tang, which means the metal goes all the way to the end, from the tip to the end. This part of the knife is called the tang. The finished piece is called the handle. Yes, it's called the handle. Um, but parts of the knives, tip, this part here is also the tip, the belly, the heel, the handle, as I said, this of course is the edge. That's where the blood comes from. I got stories. And the bolster, okay, whether it's a stamped or a forged blade, right above the handle is called the bolster. Technically, the bolster is this part of metal from when they thin it out and pull it out to the handle. This hitch right here would be called the bolster, sometimes a sticker, like on a hinkle. For example, a Henkel knife um, or a Mercer, okay, some of the more higher end classic butcher chef's knives, you can really see how we go from the metal to the handle and then it flattens out. So this little curved area is called the bolster. So just more of a fact for you. For the notes, that's part of the knife no matter what. It's right above the handle, we call it the bolster and that's where we hold the knife. Right there, pinch grip. That is how you hold a knife in the professional kitchen. This is how you should hold the knife in your private, in your residential kitchen. This bad. Don't do that. This is bad. This is good. This is bad. Bad, good, good, bad. Don't do this. But here's why. Oh, I got ahead of myself. I'm sorry, everybody. This is the Japanese knife. This is a Japanese chef's knife. Also handmade but it's a hybrid. It has the shape and form of a chef's knife, but it has the scallops on the side like a Sentoku knife. So you get the best of both worlds. Um, this particular knife, it has a D-shaped handle. I don't know if you guys can make that out or not. So if anyone says, is there a left hand or a right hand knife for this particular brand? Yes, there is actually, um, to fit in the hand, right-handed or left-handed. When you're talking double-edged blades, which really is just your everyday thing, you have to go specifically search for a single-edged kitchen knife. They're ambidextrous, unless they have a shaped handle. 
So unless you're curious and want to do your own research, that's fine. But it honestly isn't worth going down that rabbit hole, you guys, of a single edge blade, a double edge blade, right hand, left hand, and, and that form and function. 99% of the blades out there are double edged, okay, unless you're specifically looking. So price point, this is a Chicago cutlery. I think it was bought at King Supers, 20 bucks, maybe, okay? But wicked sharp, because I've made it wicked sharp. This, one of my favorite knives, these two are equal in terms of my favorite. Um, this was a Father's Day gift. Thanks, honey. Live TV, what are you gonna do? Um, and love it, okay? Nice and heavy and sturdy. This knife is mixture between the two. Uh, I got this from my sister. Um, it's nice and tall, which will make sense when we get into actually cutting something, but it's also super thin, wicked sharp. Okay, this is a Shoon, not a paid endorsement, but the brand is Shoon. This one's about a buck 60. You can get them on Amazon. This is a Fantech. It is made in Germany. This guy's about 90. Also Amazon. Again, not a paid endorsement disclaimer here, just Chef Steve's personal opinion. What's the takeaway? Just like any professional tool, be comfortable with what you have and take care of it. Even if you have residential, okay? I'm not really a stuck up kind of chef, you guys. I have store-bought, you know, cheap everyday residential stuff in my kitchen because I've used it my whole life and I, I'm used to it. So that's the gap I try to bridge is bringing technique, okay, professional quality technique into the home. So I, I try, I kind of balance that. Um, oh, very much so, Charlotte. Very much. So. It has to do with your technique and your care of the product. Okay, it's my analogy is. Um, tools you bought at Kmart versus tools you bought at say Snap-on. Which one's gonna last longer? Okay, they'll both cut fine, but they're a little more sturdy. That's, you know, professional grade versus residential grade. Residential's fine. You have to take care of it and it may not be as sturdy, but um, I digress. We could definitely, we could have session four on equipment, quite honestly, and an hour wouldn't be long enough. So. Most of the time, I'm going to grab one of these two. I'm going to grab one of these two. Every once in a while, I happen to just grab this guy because it's light um, or it's just what I feel like. Um, so, ooh, side point real quick, you guys. If your knives don't come with these, also, Amazon, um, knife guards. Very, very, very important to get your knife guards. Questions? Again, it's okay if you don't have questions. Ooh, great question. Great, 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 great question. Here, I will show you, is the ideal place to store your knives. It's one of these guys. Now, as you can see, that one's full. So I just realized I have a lot of knives in my kitchen. So I have a full knife block. The ideal place is one of two places, okay? The goal, so let's back up. What's our goal of storage? We don't want them damaged. We don't want them to fly off the counter. Really, that's the goal. We don't want to cut anyone and we don't want the knives damaged. So anywhere that would fulfill that. But let me give you some recommendations drawer is great with guards okay Here, here's my I'll, tell, I'll put it this way here's my silverware drawer you guys okay no no embarrassment this is real yes i'm a professional chef but look what i just do at my house okay um something like this separated yes this is great for just silverware but same concept with your knives um you can get separators, which I highly recommend if you want to spend the money on those wooden knife block in drawer, I recommend it. You don't have to. The goal is safety, 
for everybody in the kitchen and the knife as well, just as important, especially if you were to get a knife that cost a buck 50, 200 bucks, 800, $900, $1,000, right? So anywhere, my two favorite knives, because I'm out of room, and honestly, they're too heavy for my uh, magnetic strip over here. This is actually a really good idea, you guys. Um, they're out of the way, they're safe. When my daughter was little, she couldn't reach them. Uh, but these are too heavy. I discovered that at about 2 a.m. Uh, the night I tried to put them on the magnetic. Yeah, there we go. Some of you are like, oh, that's what he means. Yeah. So they, they are too heavy for that magnet. So they go right over here on my counter in their, in their knife guards over by the knife block. So really, if any, the best place is in a block or on a magnetic strip. This is what we do in the pro restaurants, by the way, is magnetic strips on the wall. Um, they're up out of the way, unused space and whatnot. But at home, make sure the blade is covered and protected and they're not gonna risk falling off the counter or getting knocked off the counter and um, damage the knife or heaven forbid damaging your foot. That, that's really your takeaways. So whatever fits those criteria, you're, you're good. Okay, that is correct. Real good question, Charlotte. That is correct. The block acts, acts as the guard. That blade is total, and then having the right shape and size. So th those are Henkel residentials. Uh, I can't put my 14 inch Mercer in there, it's too big. I mean, it'll hold it, but then I got that much of the knife sticking out. So, uh, great, great question. All right, the boards. Long story short with boards is these are worth spending the money. This particular board is a Boost brand. Uh, it's about $200. You do have to take care of it. Wooden boards, even the ones you get for 15 bucks at King Supers, they need to be oiled, they need to be waxed about once a month maybe once a week, depending on how often you use them. We like, wood, chefs will say they like wood because it's fast. What does that mean? That means the wood grain is soft enough to buffer the knife, but not too soft to drag on the blade. Plastic, believe it or not, will grab that blade a lot. Wood doesn't seem to do that. So um, you guys may have noticed the theme, I don't buy the nice stuff myself. I got this from my mother-in-law. Um, so, um, these really are worth the money. They, when taken care of, this board will last probably my entire life and, and never have to replace it. This board, you guys, King Supers, uh, which is our Kroger, by the way. Um, let's see, South Carolina, you guys might have Food Lion down there. At least they did in Virginia when I lived there. But anyway, this is our Kroger. Uh, is King Supers is 15 bucks. It's bamboo. Um, probably 10 years old. Still have it, still use it. The rubber is worn down, but still love it. That's what I use is just a sheet, a shelf liner, drawer liner, super cheap. Technically, this is from a rug liner. I had like four by eight big roll up and it cut me off a piece. Okay. So we talked about knives. We talked, I put my other knife away. I told you guys 90% of what I do is on purpose. The other 10% is just me being me and we roll with it. So knives, you're honing stone. This does not sharpen the knife by definition, okay? Sharpening, you have to remove metal and restore, recreate the edge. What this does is it realigns that established edge. So picture the old Gillette shave commercials where they zoom in on the, on, the, on the razor blade edge, okay? You've got a sharp edge. Every time you use a knife, it starts to bend those microscopic feathers down flat. And so when we stroke a knife against the steel, we're restoring one edge. Here's why we go both directions. Then we restore the other edge. And we put those feathers, microscopic metal feathers, back into alignment. And that's what keeps it sharp. The residential kitchen, twice a year, maybe, if you want to maintain the sharp edge on your blade 
you get them professionally sharpened. Okay. Or spend the 80 bucks and get you one of those chef mate electric sharpeners. Those are fine. I have one of those. So how do we do this? The goal is to go from the heel to the tip. Hold this nice and sturdy blade away from you. That's all you have to do. Always blade away. I would rather cut you before I cut me. Always blade away. If that's all you have to do, you guys. Ooh, there will probably, great question, Ashley. There will probably be, no, it's not a dumb question, Charlotte. Although I didn't see um, your question before Ashley, so she beat you. There's probably gonna be about three or four knife sharpeners in your city or town, no matter what. Here's why. Because there's restaurants in your city or town and restaurants don't do their own knives. They either hire someone if they own their knives or they're on a lease, believe it or not. And every week that company comes in and grabs all the knives in the restaurant and gives them freshly sharpened and sanitized knives. And then they'll go and you know sharpen and sanitize those knives and give it to the next restaurant down the street. And so there's a running lease throughout the city and the knives basically just rotate. Nobody knows that's what happens, but that's usually the case. And any knife sharpening business, even though they have uh, professional contracts with restaurants, they're gonna do residential. They'll probably charge a premium, but if you live in a town or a city, there will be professional knife sharpeners there. And I think we're all old enough. Uh, yellow pages, uh, to, to be honest. <laughs> okay, what do we got? Ooh, yes, it can be. That is not a dumb question at all, Charlotte, okay? Oh, of course. Great question too, Michael. Um, this knife here, my paring knife. In culinary school, I still use this, by the way. I got this in culinary school. I dropped it. I still use it. It's wicked sharp. I had to grind it down. Now, I was lucky to have a chef, and in culinary school, they taught me how to do it. It's not part of the regular curriculum, but um, I dropped it, and the tip just... So he taught me using that tri, using a three grit stone, how to grind it all the way down by hand and then restore the edge. So most definitely, most definitely. Um, if it's too close to the heel and too deep in the actual edge, it may be a lost cause. And the knife sharpener, which I'm sure they have a like career name, I honestly don't know what they are, but the, the person who has the knife sharpening business, will know if the blade itself is a lost cause. And I would take their word for it, okay? Because they're refusing to service you and take your money because they, you know, they would be an honest person in that sense. If they say it's not worth fixing, I would defer to them. And then you'd have to replace it. But yeah, most definitely, a knife is repairable. Oh, okay. The night, the name of my the sharpener, Chef's Mate. How oh, it's buried, um, but it's Chef's Mate is the brand name again, Amazon, and they have multiple levels and multiple angles. Oh boy, we're really okay. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Sentoku knife, Chef's knife. or hybrid knife, chef's knife, your everyday chef's knife. If it's shaped like this um, and not a specialty item is gonna be 20 degrees. Okay, flat edges of the blade, they come together. That angle there, 20 degrees. That's important to know if you're gonna sharpen your own knives because then and, and with a tool like, like the chef's mate, uh, because it's going to have different slots that are different angles. And if you put the knife in the wrong slot, that's not going to be as effective. This guy, your typical 20 degrees. Live TV, what are you going to do? I'm off duty. That, my wife's the nurse. She said, I'm off duty. Um, should you ever try to catch a knife? 
exactly. Mm -mm -mm. No, nope, you get your toes out of the way and let the chips fall. Okay. So how red am I right now? <laughs> okay. This guy here, 16 degrees. It's a special Shun um, feature. Sentoku knife traditionally is 18 degrees. That's good to know if you go, if you have that three stage or a knife sharpener, which is plug it in and then the grinder wheels turn. Okay, super safe. But um, that's why that's important and why they would have different numbers on the chef's mate. All right, time for Chef Steve to take a deep breath. What did I say, Rebecca? You guys get the full Chef Steve? And she goes, oh, well, I don't know if that's a good thing or not when we were chatting initially. Okay. Um. <laughs> cool. So honing, that's all you need to do. You can either sweep or pull straight. The goal is to drag that blade across the honing steel because this is harder metal than this to realign the edge that is all you're doing you don't need to get all up here and crazy like you might have seen on tv that's bad for the knife okay every time that knife goes clang 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 bad if you've ever seen chef ramsey that's it right so when you understand the form and function it kind of makes a little bit more sense so you can either pull straight, as I said, or sweep, and then you just go both directions. What we tend to do, you guys, and why it looks so fast, is we hit it both ways, as opposed to just going here, and then back to the heel, and here, we'll go up, and then back, and then back, and then up. So we're doing double duty, and you don't notice it. Some chefs will do it blade towards you, mm -mm -mm. Okay, personal preference, but mm -mm. blade away and just stay in the pocket. Okay, there's no reason to get crazy. Don't do that. So that's what we're doing with this guy. Oh boy, time flies. Okay, uh-oh, we may go a little over time. I recognize and understand those of you that need to get off right at five. Um, we just having so much fun. I'm very sorry. All right, so let's dive in. So we talked about pinch grip, right? Pinch grip is how you hold the knife. Here's why. If you have your finger on the back of the knife, when you go to chop, that knife will turn in your hand. Practical example, you're cutting a piece of chicken or a steak. Nah, this has happened. You go cut, 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 because you're using this knife instead of a steak knife. What happened? Mm -hmm. I see some heads nodding and it turns and that steak or chicken goes flying across the kitchen. Snack, smacks your husband or your wife in the face. There's ketchup all over or whatnot. Same thing. Pinch grip. When you pinch grip, you have control over this knife on every axis. Okay. Now, what do we do with the other hand? I want everybody to take their off hand, left hand or right hand. You have one that holds the food and one that holds the knife, right? The one that holds the food, take, hold it up and look at the back of it. You don't actually have to look at it, but that's how I get you to hold it up. Bend your fingers, and <laughs> put them down on the board. The board, your table, your leg, whatever. The goal here is I want you to feel your fingertips. Here's where the claw or thing comes into play. See, it makes sense now, okay? This is super specific because I have stories. This is how we hold things. This is not how we should be cutting things. This is not how we should be cutting things. Bad. This is how we cut things. This is your other hand because one's holding the knife. Keep the food against the board. You don't want to chase your food across the board. So what's important here, now this is, I'm going to deviate a little bit, but is to do a pico de gallo, we need to get rid of the gut or else we're gonna have soupy pico de gallo, the guts and seeds. How do you do that? You cut your tomato into fourths. Generally, okay, you're gonna cut and then turn and cut, but to show technique, I'm gonna do it slightly different. Okay, 
Don't squish your food. How do we elevate something like a pico? Attention to detail, quality, and technique. Don't squish your food. We always teach skin side down because the outside of a tomato is nature's armor, second only to an egg, okay? But that rolls all over the place. Put the flat side on the board, but you better use a knife correctly. Sawing motion, don't squish your food. Let a knife do what a knife is supposed to do. Watch, wicked sharp knife, right? I leaked that all over my board. This is squished. Nice official culinary term. This is all squished. Okay. Attention to detail. I wouldn't want to bite down on that. Your guest wouldn't want to bite down on, on, that, on that. Okay. So working clean here. Yes. It's easier to go skin side down. And we will when we go to do juliennes and dices and stuff. But here quartering something, put the flat side on the board. Okay, fingertips hold the food, or in this case, set your knife, stabilize using your whole arm, stabilize and saw. Let the knife do what a knife does. Okay, now, how do we get rid of the guts? This is called a canoe cut, pinch grip, but I'm gonna rotate the knife in my hand, making a flat knife. Get in here just inside the flesh, follow that contour, and then you don't have to let go, but I, I do this to show you flat knife. That is not a flat knife because my knuckles are in the way. That's a flat knife. So this way I can watch here and here and get rid of the gut. It's called the canoe cut. No scooping. No scooping. Don't do that and chase the food or push the knife towards your fingers. That bad. Up here, saw, sawing motion. And you can turn it a little bit to get be a little more specific and you come under. That goes in the trash bowl. If you end up with a little leftovers, that's fine. You just run your thumb through and you have a nice plank, okay? Oh my gosh, six minutes. How do, or do we feel if we go a little long? But we are recording this. So I don't know, Rebecca, I defer to you here, if you can speak on that. Keep, keep going. For those of you who need to leave at five, feel free to leave at five. No guilt. Um, it will be recorded. So you'll be able to okay. watch the end. I've mean, I got a lot of guilt there. <laughs> um, I do, honestly, you guys. I said I'm so no sorry, guilt. I'm <laughs> having so much fun. OK, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, all right, long ways first. Always cut the long ways first. We would call these a julienne, a batonet, and that has specific dimensions, but always the long ways. But look at my fingers, okay? Look at this, claw, not here. Look at what happens to my thumb when you get lazy. Look where my thumb is. Okay, I was 19 years old working at the keg, steakhouse and bar. I was on about chicken number 20 for grilled chicken salads prepping and I got lazy, I got tired and I got like this and I was cut, 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 wham. That's what I mean when I say stories. I say that because I don't want you guys to go through this. Seriously, whether I'm you know, speaking to adults or to, to high schoolers or to kids, same thing. Um, quick disclaimer, uh, this might be, make you a little squeamish, but I now know how they get the needle through my nail. I'll leave it at that. Don't, don't do that. Stay up on your fingertips. That's why I stress it so much, you guys, okay? And yes, depending on your audience. Now with the high school kids, I go you know, the whole way and tell them everything about the story, but um, that's how we get their buy-in. So, It's memorable, right? Claw, all this, that's the whole idea. But I tell that so you guys don't end up discovering it like I did on the, on the series. Technique is important. Stay up on your fingertips. And one more real time. Okay, so we have long ways first. I like to do a slice 
when I'm doing Julienne or Batonne, otherwise known as the long strips. But you can do a chop motion if you want. When you do a chop, make sure you run that knife flat. Okay, if you've ever tried to cut and dice a tomato and you end up with a bunch of strips that aren't removed from each other, that's because you rocked the knife. This is why a knife is shaped this way. Run that flat side across the board to finish. And I'm exaggerating, but you have to finish that cut. Now you are skin side down as a rule, okay? I like to chop when I'm doing the cross cuts because if you try to slice, it tends to splay out the strips, the juliennes, and you don't get a good cube. So down and forward, down and forward. I also tell students open the door is another way to remind yourself to keep that thumb protected. Just turn the knob like so. And keeping those fingertips down, knuckles guide the knife, fingertips hold the food. Chef Ramsey teaches a three finger rule. It's hard for me to do that, injuries and some other reasons on my wrist. You need to be comfortable, the takeaway is fingertips, this is why I had you bend your fingers, fingertips hold the food, knuckles guide the knife. We're never going to cut the tip of our finger off again. Okay, yes, I said again, and anyway. Okay, we have our diced tomato. Technically, this would be a small dice, okay, slightly bigger, maybe quarter inch, but we have our evenly diced tomato. Onion, I'm going to try to step on the gas here a little bit, you guys. Onion, the goal is technique, so, but technique and then safety. Trying to work clean as much as possible. Always with your globular spherical fruit, vegetable, yes, this is a vegetable, this is a fruit, okay? You're gonna go north-south, unless you're doing rings. So if you want slices or rings for onion rings or for burgers, um, citrus rings, okay, lime rings, okay, whatever you're gonna cut across the equator every other time it's north, south, no matter what. That's just kind of a rule of thumb. Set your knife, stabilize your food, down and forward. Hey, onion's pretty stout. We don't have to worry about squishing the onion. Cut the top off, we don't use it. Also notice I haven't bothered with the sticker because I'm saving time. Now I have a corner that I can easily peel the onion. If it's nice and fresh onion, most of the time it'll come off all in one shot. If you have to grab the first layer, and sometimes there's that sort of sub skin that might be attached to the first layer, just peel the first layer of the onion. It's okay, onions have layers. So does parfait cake and ogres. So, yes, I just made a Shrek reference. Okay, working clean. We're right back to where we wanna be. Verticals, horizontal. So, fingertips hold the food. Knuckles guide the knife. Here, I don't want to cut the root because basically I'm doing a blooming onion here. Okay, like from Outback. Also, that's where the majority of the tears live. There's a high concentration of that chemical that mixes with the air and turns into sulfenic acid, which is why we cut, cousin of sulfuric acid. Nothing you can do about it. Maybe you can mitigate it if you stick a piece of bread in your. Don't do that. Okay. Wear swim goggles is about the only thing you can do or do it a lot and get used to it. Down and back. It takes practice to kind of get that timing right of down and pull back, but I'm still letting the knife do what the knife's supposed to do. The more of these verticals I make, the smaller my diced onion is gonna be. Fingertips are holding, knuckle is sticking out. I'm exaggerating for the video here, you guys. Coming around here, stop at the knuckle, down and back. I've stabbed myself too many times coming right at the onion. So I come around for safety. And it's usually not that pronounced when I'm just going for real, but I wanted you guys to see that is important technique. Up and over and come back. Back to our flat knife. Do our horizontals. Sometimes, yes, it falls apart. A little bit you just pick these up and hope the students don't notice get in tight we want to keep those juliennes together sawing motion try not to splay out those blooming onion strings that's how you get your nice tiny diced onion okay 
questions about onions, questions about anything. You guys are awesome. Those of you who stayed on board, I'm very sorry. I don't want to say I had too much fun, but I didn't stay as focused as I should have. Okay. Great questions, though. Great conversation. You're going to get those questions, by the way. You, you really are going to, you're probably going to get those questions when you're up in front of your students. Working clean. This is also how we balance flavor at the very final dish. If I'm done, put the onions in. I don't want to randomly accidentally get more onion in. Now, jalapeno, do you guys know what are we taught where the heat comes from in chili peppers? Let me hear you or put it in chat. The seeds. You are correct, Ashley. That is what we are taught. It unfortunately is not where they come from. Amy, you are correct. That is what we're taught. It's actually, yes, I'm well actually guy. It's the pit, the center, the core, what the seeds are attached to is the heat. The seeds only have about like a half a percent, according to science, of, okay, we're gonna have some seeds in this one because I didn't put that in the trash bowl, of capsaicin. It's actually in the pit. So a lot of instructional videos won't even mention this. They'll just say, well, get rid of the pit. You know, we, so we got, we core it, we get rid of that, okay, get rid of the seeds. And then they'll talk about the membrane or the vein needs to be, all that is is just leftover pit, okay, that didn't get cut out when you seeded the thing. So it actually is what the seeds are attached to and not the seeds. But with our technique, flat knife, okay, holding everything down, you don't even necessarily need the other hand. And all it is is technique, you guys. Sawing motion. Now, big jalapeno, kind of get those fingers spread out a little bit. I like to do a slice motion when we're doing the fine julienne or the little guy. Keeping in mind, keep those knuckles protecting the fingertips. Look, one finger will hold the food in place if you do this technique properly. It's about using your whole body mechanism. Square them up because math, however wide you cut them, you go the same width and you end up with three dimensional squares called cubes. So fingertips hold, again, down and forward. I have tiny little food. I'm just gonna stay in nice and tight with the heel because it's the tall part of the knife against the knuckle for safety. And that's how you get the little guys. So however wide you cut the strips, you turn them 90 degrees and cut the same width and you get squares in a three dimensions called cubes. It's deceptively simple. Long ways, turn them, cut them, you get squares because math. All right, garlic, real important when teaching garlic. Because of all the different videos and instructions, and I saw somebody do this, this, okay, here's the right way. You can run it back and forth in your hands if you want. That's fine. It'll get the, the peel off. This hurts. Like, seriously, it's wood. It's sharp. Okay. It, it, uh -uh. Set it on the board. Set your knife and give it a pop. Blade away from you with the heel of your hand or a hammer fist. Don't do this. I've seen it too many times. What happens if that blade slips? Stories, that's what happens, okay? Blade away from you and just give it a pop. Try to remember, don't get your hands underneath here because that'll hurt your knuckles, mm -mm -mm. okay? Set it, blade away, and just give it a little smash. I like to cut the root off because I said earlier, it hurts, you don't wanna bite down on that. If you have your garlic that's sprouted a little bit because you forgot about it on the counter for a couple weeks, okay, just get rid of that guts, the green sprout part. Um, heartburn lives in there. So tiny food, just like we did the 
jalapeno. I'm doing a hybrid motion here, you guys, like so. But still tiny food, tiny claw, stay here at the heel. The knife is still touching my middle knuckle. It's riding along the knuckle. It's just technique. And so you, you can just keep turning the food. If you think you're getting too close to the fingertips, just turn it to where you can stay safe. And so we have just shaved up garlic here. Rough chop, I'm sure you've seen this a thousand times, but here's how you mince. Here's how you fizz actually are to mince something. You're gonna grab the knife and the handle somewhere in here, it's different for every knife. And I want you to picture your hand is suspended from the ceiling. All you're gonna do is lift up and down. Don't think tap, 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 like a drummer drum roll. Think lift the heel up and down and let it rock between the heel and the tip of the knife. That's all we're doing. This hand gives it something to bounce off of as well as protect you from smacking yourself in the face. And once you practice that timing, we're actually cutting four times faster. This hand is doing nothing. It's just a backstop. Then doing a rough job. Okay, and with practice, go ahead and buy minced garlic at the grocery store in a jar for five bucks. These are like 75 cents. And that's kind of fun. The sharper the knife, however, I've discovered though, you guys, the less mess you make when it flies all over the place. But minced garlic. I can't do that too much because I have downstairs neighbors. All right. We are working clean. Now you get sticky when you do garlic. Lime juice actually helps with that. Trying to work as clean as possible. But lime juice will help. And this is when we're not really doing a recipe. This is just a list of ingredients. Fresh rag. I like to pulverize the lime because I like a lot of lime in there. Okay, round food. We need to quarter it. Set your knife, stabilize your food, saw. Same thing. Okay, skin side down traditionally. Also, don't do that. Set your knife first and then come up and over. Again, you don't want to stab yourself. Why? Stories, see? Hold your food, stabilize your food. Skin side down is my preferred, up is my preferred because it's flat, but you really need to push and hold the food with your whole arm. So we have our quartered lime. Get in there, pulverize that lime. If you're recreating a recipe though, you're gonna squeeze the lime into a separate vessel and then measure it out. But personal preference, or you're just cooking from home, just pulverize that lime. It actually does help, help take care of the garlic on your fingers. So, what is the herb we use, you guys? A little bit of participation here again. What's the herb that goes in Pico de Gallo? Cilantro. Correct. Good job, cilantro. Do you guys know what they call it in Europe? No. They call it coriander, which okay. you may recognize as that seed spice. That's because it is the seed to this plant. And the difference is French versus Spanish, to be honest. Hmm. So take the 10 seconds to stack up your leaves. Okay, usually only one stalk is fine. You need about four to five leaves. But stack up your leaves. Now, by the way, one in eight people on the planet hate this stuff because it tastes like soap. <laughs> Odds are at least one of you on this webinar hates cilantro because it tastes like soap. Famously, Julia Child hated cilantro. She never used it. Stack up your leaves, roll them up. And there's nothing you do about that, by the way. It's just how you were born. Sorry. Stack up your leaves. We do this with basil as well, you guys. Uh, it's a lot easier and more obvious because there's you know, big leaves. But start here and down and forward. If you've ever done fresh herbs at home and ended up with a green stain on your board, 
you're doing it wrong. Nice, sharp knife, long, smooth strokes. Don't mince your herbs. This goes for all fresh green herbs. If you're gonna throw them in the stock pot or something, don't, don't worry about it, they're just gonna cook down. But a nice fresh presentation like this, you need to make sure you don't bruise the leaves. So you don't chop, go like this on them. You need to nice and run your knife through. I tell, I reference to the students, remember biology class, plant cells and animal cells? That's okay, Rebecca. First step is admitting. Well, everybody's been doing it wrong until they learn the right way. Nothing wrong with that, because school and stuff. So nice, this is called a chiffonade. So nice, clean, no bruised edges. And this is where their students like to do the whole salt bay thing. So, and last but not least, you guys, we'll get a nice stir. I haven't seasoned this yet, and that's on purpose. Typically when a chef says seasons, we're talking salt and pepper. Unless this is just gonna go on say like street tacos or something like that, how do we eat this? What do we eat that with? Tortilla chips, obviously. Correct. What is all over these guys? Salt. Salt, exactly right, Ashley. Yep, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Yep, everybody, <laughs> salt. So, test your food with the chips first, then go back and make adjustments with salt and pepper. It's these little tiny things of how we elevate. If you make it seasoned perfectly, taste, season, adjust, taste, great. Then hit it with a salty chip, oops. This is why we don't use a lot of salt in Asian cuisine. Because majority of those base flavors, fish sauce, soy sauce, okay, they're salty, high in sodium, high in salty flavor. We don't need extra salt. So that was definitely the long way around. Uh, but our takeaway, pinch grip, claw. Really, it's that re pinch grip is just classic how we've always taught it. But claw, um, cat's paw, tiger claw, eagle talon. Many teachers have come up with different references for, especially in high school. Okay, they're the raptors, so they do raptor claw. The okay, so but it, something that the kids can relate to something your students, whether they're teens, kids, adults, can relate to, and whatever that is for you. Um, eye contact. Hopefully, obviously I can't see myself looking at the camera, but hopefully I did a pretty good job of looking at the camera so you can see my eyes. Hand washing, huge. We have to be the example. Um, boy, what else? Pinch grip, claw, using your whole body, um, don't squish your food is my colloquial way of saying use the knife properly, right? Um, now, in terms of teaching this, don't be the next me, be the first you. Students are going to notice that. It's okay to share what you do at home. It's okay to uh, give your personal spin on things. Obviously you wanna to try to watch your time a little better than me, but um, be yourself, be the first you. It, it, you guys are already halfway there um, being comfortable in front of people. You know, as teachers, as educators, as, as whatever your career is, you're already halfway there. Um, Cause most people, right? I'm sure you've heard this, hate public speaking, you know, it's worst thing ever. So you're already there. Your confidence is gonna come from your personal spin, mm -hmm. really, until after you're comfortable with these. And, and literally practice, okay, pinch grip. These are conscious things that have to be practiced. And even if you make the mistake, I, I don't know the last time I dropped a knife. I really don't. I mean, and look, poof, we're complete strangers. Not anymore, but we're complete strangers. And look, it happened. It, accept it, run with it. It's live TV. Don't hide from it. 
okay, so there's two philosophies. Do you just, um, you know, you don't highlight, you don't apologize for your mistake. If you're a professional NFL broadcaster, sure, you just, you move on. But they have, there's other things to keep the attention. If it's just you, hmm, you know, there's, there's, you're by yourself. You don't have a color commentator to pick up the slack and move on. It's just you. You have to acknowledge it. And they'll eat you alive if, if you're afraid of it. It happens. Accept it. I stopped trying to be the cool kid when I was 15. True story. Okay. Um, but it's technique focused. Technique is the way we execute a recipe. A recipe is just the instruction. That's what you're trying to communicate is my, my wife's a nurse. There's a technique on how she does an IV. There's multiple techniques. One is better for her. The other is better for the patient. Be nice to your nurses. So <clears throat> you see my point though, it's all technique. How did Bob Ross do a happy tree? Draw your line, tap out with a fan brush, boom, there's a tree. That is a technique. And cutting things safely is just technique. Pinch grip, claw. All day. I want the knife to touch your knuckle. It does take practice to not lift it up too far and you, you clip some knuckles until you get real comfortable, get your Band-Aid and a glove and keep going. But functionally speaking, this is like the fence on a table saw. This doesn't move, the knife rides on the knuckle and you go up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay, big movements usually are dangerous. Okay, you just need to clear the food so you don't scrape the food all over the board. You don't need to be way up here. Dangerous. Tiny, that's why I say tiny food, tiny claw. It's like I had with the jalapeno when I had with the garlic, with the cilantro. It doesn't change. You just, the claws open or close. So, questions? Oh, of course, Ashley. Oh, she left already. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Chef. I am going to stop the recording.